Right. Yeah. Uh oh. Then I'm fine though. Nothing can happen. Okay, so in an effort to keep on time, if everyone who's still trickling in can do so uh, quickly and quietly, we will get started. So the last session this morning, we have uh, two talks. We have the focus talk for Aruna uh, from Ingo, and then we'll have a focus on the Ephraim Decay Station from Robert Giavac, and then we'll close out with the resolutions. So without further ado, Ingo, tell us what's going on at Florida State. Morning, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me here okay? Does that come through? All right. So uh, this is a tradition that we started a couple of years ago when we formed this uh, association called Aruna that binds together the university labs in the US and is there to improve the science infrastructure at these labs and also to represent it to the greater community so that people know all the resources that are available here. And today I'm happy to uh, give an example of one of the Aruna Labs, Florida State University, and I want to show you, uh, give you a flavor of the things we do and uh, also the things that we want to do and come next. And uh, that is what I'm aiming to do today. So Florida State University has an accelerator lab. We have a combination of a tandem with a booster. And we're also using it for radioactive beams. We will see examples of that. The lab is funded mostly by NSF. Uh, there's a smaller DOE grant. And uh, very recently, we became a member of the Center for Excellence, the Centaur Center, which is uh, spearheaded by Texas A&M. And that is also allowing us some new initiatives here. Um, Aruna, of course, was something that we were involved in from the beginning, and we are, we are very happy to see that now it's a thing. You know, over the years, we have now had this represent the university facilities at these types of meetings. Uh, we have at Florida State programs in nuclear structure and nuclear astrophysics. We have a strong program in gamma spectroscopy, which is getting even stronger now. And we're also pursuing uh, topics of nuclear astrophysics with stable or with radioactive ion beams. We have our own facility there. One of the new facilities we have is the Super Enge Split Pulse Spectrograph, and you'll hear about that in a second. So Aruna, of course, is this colorful and diverse collection of laboratories throughout the country. And we are up here. We are doing the whole thing alphabetically. Uh, we have tandem labs. We have a bunch of those. We have tandems between 9 megavolts, 1 and a half smaller labs. There's a whole variety of fandographs, and, and there are other facilities that are bound together. We have also Texas A&M, and of course our host, the tunnel, is also part of Aruna. So there's a lot going on in Aruna, and uh, I, I guess we we are just uh, have too many things to do because a lot of things uh, you have already heard at this meeting, all the initiatives that are centered here. Now, this is about Florida State, so I want to focus more on that. Uh, first of all, uh, there is uh, something that you may not have heard. We have just completed a search for new faculty position, and we were lucky that we were able to hire two new faculty, Vandana Tripathi and Mark Spieker, who will both work at our facility and at the National Laboratories. Uh, they join the rest of the faculty. We have Sergio Almaras Calderon, Paul Cordell, Sam Tabor, myself, Mark Riley, and uh, Kirby Kemper, who is supposedly retired but really can't get his, can't stay out of the lab. That's how he is. Very important component of our group is, of course, we also have a strong uh, theory group. And we've heard from Jorge. And we also have a colleague, Sasha Volia. So both of these theory programs bind in very well with the focus of the experimental program as well. So there's a great synergy in having both in one place. The laboratory itself is the way that laboratories grow. You see they grow in layers like onions. 
uh, we have the tandem lab, which is essentially in its original configuration feeding these beam lines, but then in the 90s, the Linac was added, and most of the experimental work is done here, but actually substantial parts are also using the tandem beams in this room. That gives us a lot of flexibility switching back and forth. <coughs> if you <coughs> want to understand what the combination of the tandem and the Linac does for you, here you have the profile of the beam energy is available, the tandem only. You see that for heavier beams, the energies drop very rapidly under the Coulomb barrier. But the Linac essentially doubles the energies coming out of the tandem, which allows us to do a fair amount of heavy iron beam physics. Um, one of the focuses that I've been most involved with is, is the in-flight radioactive beam facility, Resolute. And of course, one of the bigger, uh, the other, I would say, focus of the lab has always been gamma spectroscopy. And right now, the gamma array is over here, but it will come back into the target room pretty soon. And this here is still essentially a placeholder in my graphics. I have to update that to include the actual spectrograph here. Uh, that is a new facility that can be fed both with tandem beams, of course. We can always inject the tandem through the Linac even when it's off. And Linac beams, which allows us a new program around the angle. OK, uh, pictures. Our tandem is painted in garnet. That's not a surprise. If you want to pick a color, you, you're always safe with the school colors. Uh, this is, of course, a machine from around 1970, but it's, it's running very well. It, it's, of course, has many new components in it. The superconducting Linac is technology that was adapted, was, was taken from the development of Argon National Lab of the Atlas facility, and uh, that has 14 superconducting split ring resonators. And that, as I said, essentially doubles the available beam energies. Now, what do we do with these heavy ion beams? A lot of the program has to do with feeding them into an in-flight radioactive beam facility resolute, which, the, in, in this case, the beam comes from the right, I have to tell you. So the production target is, up, is over here. The beam is separated through an active uh, RF resonator that then feeds into a magnetic separator, and we can do all kinds of experiments at the end of this beam line. So the important property here is because of this dispersive stage, we actually get a fairly decent beam energy resolution for this type of in-flight facility while maintaining a good efficiency because the resonator allows us to push the products, which are at a much wider energy range, into the acceptance of the spectrograph of the separator. Uh, here are a couple of examples of the beams we can make. These are all using essentially single particle transfer reactions with the exception of, for instance, uh, three, uh, three helium N reactions where we transfer two protons. So we're one or two protons of stability and we have an energy range that essentially goes from, uh, this is, is around the Coulomb barrier. We're getting beams between 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 particles per second. The purity varies a lot depending on the conditions and what type of cross-sections we're dealing with for the production. But the beams can always be purified offline by tracking, uh, measuring time and, and essentially identifying the beam as it goes into your experiment. Um, one of the things we've been doing at, at the lab is developing forefront instrumentation and I want to Take as an example the Anasen active target detector that was designed for uh, proton scattering, DP, alpha P reactions with exotic beams. It was funded through an MRI by uh, the NSF. It is built in a collaboration with Louisiana State University, who really have developed as almost a second local group, you could say. Jeff and Catherine know every rest stop at I-10 between Baton Rouge and Tallahassee very well by now. And all of that work has now resulted in a very active program with these active target detectors. Well, that's a pun. Um, the local program has also led to using this detector system at other facilities. It was used in commissioning experiments for the RIA-3 facility at Michigan State. And uh, it also has now approved experiments at Triumph, which are going to happen within the next couple of years. So, an example of what we can do with it is the next example. This was an experiment done at Florida State University. We have uh, created a beam of 7 beryllium and fill this active target volume. You see the picture up here, it's really pretty. Uh, we fill this active volume with deuterium 
uh, the active target detector has proportional counter in the center, which allows you to track the particles into the barrel of silicon detectors where we measure their energy and also have position resolution. So it allows you to reconstruct the kinematics. And in this case, we are studying the reactions between 7 beryllium plus deuterium. And one of the beauties of this active target system is that you're measuring the entire excitation function in one setting and every beam particle gives you an opportunity for all of the energies that they go through as they lose energy throughout the detector. So this excitation function here is the excitation function of the events going between 7 beryllium and deuterium into protons and two alphas. So, what do we see? Uh, we see, of course, we have a complete detector, many silicon detectors in it. We can see large fractions of the available, uh, of the available uh, phase space. And when you have three particles in the final state, you can analyze what are the intermediate steps here. And uh, you see in this Dalitz plot, you have on the x-axis the invariant mass of the two alpha system, in other words, we are plotting the beryllium-8 excitation energies in an in a indirect fashion. And then on the y-axis, we have the proton plus alpha inv invariant mass squared, which shows us the excitations of 5-lithium. So this distinguishes between the d-alpha 5-lithium reaction sequence versus the dp-8 beryllium reaction sequence. And we see that over here, we see the ground state and the first excited state of 8 beryllium, but the cross-section is dominated by this 5-lithium ground state. And uh, the fact that we could observe this re relies on Anasin having essentially a wide acceptance for energies and angles, because previous experiments had not been able to observe this channel because it has relatively low energy protons, and all the triggers that were applied first depended on high energy protons. So when we look at that, we see the excitation Function here, we see energies, we see cross-section. This is actually a representation of the cross-section as the astrophysical S-factor. And we see that within the Gamow window of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is in this range around uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.6 MeV in the center of mass, we see a large resonance, which mainly shows up in this D-alpha reaction sequence. Now, this is new information, and uh, compared to the previous experiments, here was a detailed excitation function. This is uh, from Kavanagh, very, uh, from 1960s actually, very old experiment. And we are consistent with that for the part of the phase space that they could observe. And then there was another experiment that had these two data points, which was Angolo et al. And we are consistent at the higher of the data points, you could argue, but at the lower, it's clear that they missed this resonance because of their limitations in the phase space acceptance. This was a PhD thesis of Nabin Rijal and published recently in PRL. Okay, so active target detectors really open up many opportunities, and you already, already said that we're going to use this at national facilities as well. It took us a number of years to get to this type of uh, sensitivity and, and the analysis methods certainly are not totally trivial. So, there's another active target system which is actually much simpler and, and, and I'm, I'm very optimistic that we can use it to great effect here. We did the first experiment with a music-like active target detector that was developed by my colleague Sergio Almaras Calderon. And you see beautiful pictures up here. You see this is the inside of it. It's essentially an iron chamber with a Frisch grid and a multi-segmented anode, and uh, what you can do here, you can look at the energy loss throughout the detector, and here selected you see the red events are beam traces that they plotted, along with a certain fusion class of experiments where you see a fusion between fluorine-17 and carbon-12 that is contained in the gas of the detector, and you see these traces are clearly separated from the beam traces. Oops, that was probably the wrong button. All right, um, so that, that should give us pretty good results very soon. Um, Sergio Almaras Calderon is also interested in neutron detectors. We have a, a new neutron detector system that, that is called uh, Katrina. It contains deuterated benzene neutron detectors, and they have a great property that I think will, will serve us well. They have, first of all, they have a very good neutron gamma separation over wide dynamic range. But they also show in the charge, because it's deuterated benzene and it relies on the elastic scattering of deuterons with the neutrons, 
you have a distribution in the energy spectrum that actually shows you a peak at the neutron energy. So you can start to calibrate that. You actually see here a calibration run that was done with the 7 lithium pn reaction at our lab. And you see that really, depending on the energy, you see the peak of the charges that you measure move out. Now, it's not a high resolution measurement by any means. But if you combine that with the time of flight measurement, here we have an RF spectrum of the events relative to the accelerator RF. Is this still working or is it? I hardly see my laser pointer. But you see here is the timing of the neutron detectors relative to the RF, which is, of course, the time of flight signal is contained in that. When you combine that analysis of the time of flight, of the flight time, with the pulse shape discrimination and with the correlation of the energy, you actually get very clean spectra without any other coincidence here. So that is a very powerful instrument, which we want to use in coincidence with gamma ray spectroscopy in the near future. So gamma ray spectroscopy is, of course, one of the main workhorse techniques in nuclear structure. And, and we have, over the years, built up a detector array that has three clovers, one high, large volume germanium detector, and a couple of smaller detectors that we kind of found in various places. It's one of those, it's one of those devices that, that uh, really has many uh, varied history. Uh, but it has been very useful and has always been improved. We have now digital electronics for it. And uh, you see many people in the lab are using it and are apparently very happy about it. Um, I want to give uh, two examples here of the scientific program that we pursue. Uh, you see here spectra and the level scheme from two different reactions. Oh, thank you so much. Ah, the power. Yes. So the spectra you see here marked in... Now this, this also has it. Uh, the spectra show in red the new peaks observed in a certain coincidence spectrum. And here's the level scheme. You see that the level scheme of uh, 39 argon could be extended dramatically to higher excitations with the uh, goal to establish the cross-shell excitations in the shell model nucleus. And the method is we're using a carbon-14 beam uh, on aluminum target and then select in particle gamma-gamma coincidence, we select the charged particles that come out of it. And by doing so, we select the neutron-rich nuclei in, in a relatively clean manner. If you detect charged particles, you know you'd, at least you didn't lose another neutron. So with that, we can pick out these excitations very sensitively. And all of this is now used by our uh, theory colleague, Sasha Volia, and the graduate students involved here. Rebecca Lupner was very active in that to see what we learn about the cross-shell interactions in these uh, sh effective shell model interactions. So the cross-shell excitations allow us to develop a new, uh, more predictive, comprehensive shell model interaction for intruder configurations, which I would, which I would uh, argue informs also the study of much more exotic nuclei. This program will receive, we hope, and we, we have concrete plans for it, an upgrade by bringing the Clarion 2 array to FSU for such campaigns, and that will be a major boost in our sensitivity. It's just a slide I got from Mitch Almond that shows you the array. And uh, I just wanted to point out that it will reach something like 4% efficiency of 1 MeV. So that's a significant amount of germanium. OK, split ball. The split ball spectrograph was moved from Yale to FSU. And uh, this is what it looked like at Yale. This is what it looks like at FSU. Hard to tell the difference from the distance, yeah? Uh, it sounds very simple, but it actually took us a significant effort, uh, you can imagine. So the super Angus split pole was at Yale, and it has features that we like a lot. In particular, it has a large acceptance. It has a much larger acceptance, 12.8 millister radians, than any other split pole that I'm aware of. So the other thing that it has, it has a straight focal plane, which is optimized. The optics are optimized such that all the aberrations are concentrated in the theta term. So with a simple tracking focal plane detector, you can essentially correct for these effectively. And that is important for coincidence measurements. You need both the high resolution and the acceptance at the same time. So there were setups like that at Yale, and they were very successful during that time. And uh, one of the upgrades that we already made to the Yale system is that our collaborators at LSU developed this Sabre array, which uh, is supposed to do the coincidence measurement in the focal plane, and it is here already installed, and we're about to commission it in the next couple of weeks. 
The program here is one of astrophysics, precision spectroscopy for the resonances that are relevant. And here you see an example from Yale. We have not run this experiment yet, but I, I hear that, that we, we are getting much closer now. We have a good resolution already in the device, and uh, the coincidence efficiency will come to us very soon. Another program that we want to study is look at the open systems of nuclear. And here you see a, a continuum shell model calculation by uh, Sasha Volya and his group. And you realize that at all of these different oxygen nuclei, you have very wide states near the threshold. And that is an effect that we call super radiance, that people call super radiance. And we want to look at stable nuclear or close to stability nuclear, obviously with a spectrograph to study this effect. This is something that certainly has not been done in earlier days. Okay, we had a workshop at FSU, many happy faces here, and if you're interested in using this device, it is now essentially open for business. We also used it to, as an opportunity to develop undergraduate research programs. One of the beauties of this experiment is it gives you very high quality data, but the analysis is not nearly as hard as any of the other things we do. You can analyze an experiment here. You can run it in two days and analyze it in a week. And you have very significant data for a number of questions. So it really lends itself to a group of undergraduate students. And we started this pilot program this year. We want to expand it in the future. We measured five different DP experiments in a short two weeks. A couple of undergraduate students, you see their names. And we have three professors that are also involved with it. The idea is that they can take the data home, analyze it, and publish it in, with their professors who are all nuclear scientists. So this is like a specific nuclear RU. Just as an example, how also this research can connect to uh, NSCL and maybe EFRIP research. There was a study by Riley that looked at the uh, octopole collectivity in neutron-rich calcium isotopes that was done at the NSCL. And one of the questions that came up here is we really don't know much about the orbital structure in calcium orbitals, uh, in calcium nuclei at high excitations. And we just took this experiment just this summer in this undergraduate research uh, project. So you see the resolution is pretty nice. We see many peaks. This is going to be good. OK. Um, there are efforts at our lab. And I'm coming very close to the end now. Uh, there are efforts at our lab, of course, that go beyond science. We all live in a community, and we are all concerned about bringing opportunities to the wider, uh, wider society. And one of them is the STEM pipeline, the bringing young students, young minds into science is, of course, one of the things that we all love to do. And this is an effort that is spearheaded by, uh, by my colleague Paul Cottle. He started organizing very close contacts to Panama City, Bay County, Florida, where there are some really engaged uh, science teachers. And he uh, proposed this to the Centaur Center, and it got funded, to essentially create a nuclear science summer camp of five days for a number of undergraduate students that get to work with radiation detectors, measure absorptions, really learn about what it means that you have a gamma ray and what to do with it. So this has been, I think, a great success. We've taught it twice so far. And we're going to continue doing that. And here you see Sergio Almaraz giving that group of students a tour of the gamma ray of the laboratory. OK, there are other things that they learn there, but this was just an example. All right, so what is the impact on the workforce? Of course, we all love our graduate students, and, and FSU is no, no different. I just listed the students 2015 to 19 here, where they ended up and who their su supervisors are. I just wanted to essentially give you an impression of what type of diverse graduate student group we can attract to Florida State. These here are the last six graduates, and it really looks like the United Nations. I'm, I'm really proud of how that changed even over the time that I was there. The Florida State Physics Department has a very active effort to support diversity in the field, and we are benefiting from that, no doubt. So as a summary, FSU. Is an active, has active programs in nuclear structure, nuclear astrophysics. And we think of our research as being directly connected to other efforts. We're part of the community, not, not a separate niche type of program. We can bring our resources to use for other groups, and we're doing that quite a bit. LSU is certainly the most frequent one, but Indiana came there, Catania, we have many others that come by for, for an experiment or two and use our facilities. 
The SESPS, the Super Angus Split Pole Spectrograph, as I call it, is creating new science opportunities. And I, I hope that it can pick up a little bit of the slack and, and you, you should say the, the lack of the opportunity to measure such experiments that is happening with the Munich Q3D shutting down. We have uh, similar, not as high a resolution, but we have a very good spectrograph now. And we hope that this science can continue at Florida State. And I have just two statements more. Science is global, outreach is local. Our facilities are the anchors of nuclear science in different places. If you look at Aruna, we are spanning the continent. So we are your southeast dependence, you could say. But really, we are all doing similar things. The Aruna labs are a vibrant part of our part of and a resource to our community. And that's where I want to end. Thank you, Ingo. Any questions? Yep. I thank you for your gracious words about the experiment. I just prepared, because this discussion is not just happening now, uh, Moshe has <coughs> sent us some comments on the paper. I prepared this slide here, or my, my colleague Jeff Blackmon did, that summarizes both the approximation that, that the Parker estimate that was used in uh, uh, CF88 rate uh, compilation and in the React lib is essentially a constant S-factor extrapolation with a 100 MeV bar. We agree, and we stated that in the experiment, that the results from this rate that was published in 72, I think you say, <coughs> give the same effect as our, as our experiment. But you realize that this extrapolation does not, I mean, it wasn't in any way clear that that is the outcome. Our experiment, if you just look at the uncertainty of the range of the uh, allowable resonance energies, you see that there's a large variation. And yes, that is a lot lucky, I would say, coincidence that a factor three on the, at the time measured cross section gets you into the error range of our experiment. But yes, uh, it, it is consistent in the results with this estimate. And the paper was actually very clear about that. I can quote from the paper. <laughs> it is interesting to note that the estimate by Parker multiplying the Kavanaugh data by an arbitrary factor 3 predicts 7 lithium uh, equal 4.51 times 10 to the minus 10, coincidentally in the middle of our range of values. So, So I think, I, I get the sense that this is a very long discussion that's been going on and will continue. So we'll have one last question. And Robert, if you want to maybe start getting your computer hooked up.
Yes. That's correct. Those were, those were not experimental spectra at all. This was a theory. Maybe I didn't make that clear enough. We would uh, populate states, resonances through DP and use coincidence spectroscopy at the target to clean up the spectra and determine spins and really do a detailed spectroscopy above the threshold. Yes, neutron detectors also are involved. We are, no, a neutron DP, so proton neutron coincidences in a DP reaction. Okay, so let's thank Ingo again. Uh, the next talk will be from Robert G. Butch on the Ephraim Decay Station. Right, thank you very much. Is it on? Okay. So I have a privilege to present the, the white paper which we just recently uh, circulated, which prevents, presents the vision for our for the future uh, Ephrib decay station detector. This is this modular, versatile, high granular, and very efficient array, which we. Uh, conceived as a, as a community. So the white paper has a, a lot of contributors from many institutions and individuals. Uh, and I also would like to thank my, uh, my colleagues who were doing the hard work of actually putting it together. Uh, so this, uh, this document is now with EFRIP management and with DOE. And I heard yesterday it was endorsed by, the, strongly endorsed by the EFRIP and it is uh, uh, acknowledged by the, by the DOE that it should be uh, uh, funded sooner or later. So uh, we also have just elected the, a, a, a wonderful body of new uh, of users executive committee, which will communicate between the project and the, and the, and the users. So those are the individuals, and we would like to welcome them. And, 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 and encourage them to, to work with this pro with, uh, towards the success of this project. So uh, now I will walk you through salient points of this uh, white paper. And the first thing will be to really connect it to the, to the EFRI program. And we happen to be able to, to cover all the major, AD, uh, ma major areas of EFRI strategic goals. In, in uh, structure, astrophysics, intera fundamental interactions and applications. And our, our goal is to really push the frontiers and exploit this capability of, of FRIP to, 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 to get us to the most exotic isotopes with, with short lifetimes. Uh, and we want to do very complete studies. So this is really the focus. This was really our focus in finding this, uh, this vision what will be our, our hallmark, how do, we, how do we make the best device, and, and this com complexity, completeness where we can combine multiple methods is, is really what, what I want to emphasize during my talk. And the other thing is sensitivity, so we can, we can really exploit this, uh, the, 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 the isotopes which are really produced with, with even very few atoms a day. So, so sensitivity to extremely low rates is another another important thing. And this was recognized early on and the uh, EFRIP Scientific Advisory Committee always was very supportive of, of EFRIP because of this, this region. So, so EFRIP will provide us with this wonderful set of isotopes produced at uh, the range of applicable for the, for the, F, for the EFRIP decay station. So, so and, and our our unfair advantage is we don't have to do secondary reactions. We can just study the isotopes as they are produced, even at those extremely low rates. Uh, and we were, again, in a process of trying to, 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 to create this, uh, this concept of the decay station. We looked at the uh, 
set of generic experiments and how are their, what is their sensitivity to, uh, uh, for different methods to rates. And you see with, with some methods we, we go to counts per day situation. So you can connect now this plot with this plot. And then, the, then, then we thought, what do we do better? How can we even improve this reach? Uh, even, even in just starting on this fairly established, using those fairly established methods. So, so we, we want to increase the combined efficiency for, uh, for, for, for uh, sometimes very complex, uh, complex uh, experiments by orders of magnitude, order of magnitude of more. So, but before that, we, we looked at physics cases. So what, what are the compelling physics cases where we could really focus our attention? This is sort of the physics as we understand it here and now. Of course, five years from now, we will revise our goals. But let me, let me bring up a few cases where we thought uh, of uh, identifying that, that we should optimize our, our, our uh, the, the FDS to be the most efficient. So one of this is this uh, physics of weakly bind nuclei. So this is the region of calcium 60 where there are some theories which predict uh, the so-called giant halos due to the cluster of simple, single particle levels. This would be uh, an incredible uh, challenge uh, and fantastic goal to, to, to see and uh, find the evidence of this halo. And it is, uh, and, 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 and our, Detection system, for example, very, uh, very efficient neutron emission should be able to, to reach us there. So there is a, there is a, there is a variety of uh, structure problems across the nuclear sh chart. And this is where we have to think about covering all those areas in our design. So this is thin 100 region where uh, the heaviest region when we can study the, the proton-neutron correlations. The physics of nuclear shapes across the region of nuclear chart, uh, looking for, uh, for uh, triaxial or reflection asymmetric shapes, uh, study the effects of three and forces. And again, this is, you see, uh, this is a very exciting region of, of calcium 60. Uh, and then uh, nickel 78 could be another. Uh, place where new island of inversion will be, will be opening up. So, so those are the, the structure, few, few examples of structure physics where we, want to, where we want to use our instrumentation using the power of uh, different spectroscopic methods to try to address those, those issues. Uh, astrophysics is really a huge goal and huge driver for a lot of what we do. And we know that uh, we can measure some observable di directly. We can measure branching ratios and lifetimes in the strategic, strategic regions and identified previously in sensitivity studies. We can also contribute through indirect uh, measurements to, to, the, to the neutron capture cross section. So there is a, 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 an incredible potential for, for the FRIP to address it, and we can do it with, with our instrumentations. Also, just a thorough, thorough studies of uh, thorough experimentation will allow us to constrain the theories in places where we cannot reach even with effort. So, so we, can, we can make claims beyond what, what we can measure. So, and the last is, of course, uh, our contribution beyond the, 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 the let's say, the uh, uh, narrowly defined uh, nuclear physics. We want to uh, contribute to physics of nuclear in fundamental interactions or, or, or applications. And here we kind of see a, a, a thorough studies of fission fragments to be to, to cover uh, this area. So we we look at we can with total absorption spectroscopy we can, for example, address the issue of what what happens to the neutrino spectra. Or, or, or the decay heat. So this is related to the, to the nuclear energy. So those are few cases which we clearly identified and used them to, 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 to constrain our instrument uh, or, or design. Now, there are challenges in the 
at the FRIP because we are so far from stability that uh, uh, that's not going to be business as usual. We have to sometimes think about, well, there are going to be new problems and, and our instrument has to be the designed to do it. And I, the one example is the decay of very exotic R process isotopes and you can see that they will be this, this decay chain is going to be very complicated. You will produce 40 isotopes or so in, in, in this process in a very short time, and some of them will have very long, very, very short, very similar lifetimes. And the decay uh, probabilities or decay uh, branching ratios will be complicated. It will have a very complex decay path that, that you can have to measure neutrons, gammas, betas, charged particles. Uh, at the same time to be able to disentangle uh, what are the properties, the original properties of the, 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 the progeny, decay progenitor. So, so we have to be able to simultaneously measure the vari various radiation types. We have to have high granularity so we don't lose anything through summing. Uh, we have to have high combined detection efficiency and this is really critical because if you want to have provide reliable information that has to be uh, that has to be done uh, properly. And we, of course, have to worry about dynamic things like dynamic range because things can vary in energy rather broadly. So, so and, and in this, our vision, we try to, we, we looked at what can we do realistically now? What, ca what can we plan? What, what, it could, what should it be? And what, how we can go about this problem to address all those challenges? So, so we looked uh, at the, the baseline systems, so took some examples of currently used system and looked at the uh, efficiencies. And then we, we also assessed what are the uh, sort of best efficiency we can realistically obtain with modern day technologies with the instruments which we can, which we can realistically build. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the numbers cannot increase too much. You cannot have better than 100% efficiency. But it is the combined efficiency, efficiency which is critical. Because when you look at those examples of the experiments where we have various rather complex decay chains, the, multi, the efficiency multiply. And that, that becomes uh, very, very important to, to, to achieve the highest gain in, 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 in uh, combined efficiencies. And, and the analysis of various cases, which we, th this is just a few, uh, several examples, uh, told us that we can reach very large factors uh, of 10 or 50 when we try to do, uh, measure those cases which will be out there. And it's not that, the, it's not that we pick the cases which will give us this, this gain. No, those cases will be picked for us by physics. We cannot do anything about that. They're just going to decay in this complicated way, so we have to be able to be prepared for that. So, uh, so those gains of the, of the, of the new, new FDS will, will uh, give us a further isotopic reach and provide us with a much better data quality together with, of course, the, 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 the opportunities given by the FRIP production rates. So, uh, so our instrument uh, will have to be very modular and uh, combined uh, variety of detector systems and I will give you later a little bit of an overview through the through the experimental uh, through the experimental systems in details we we will ha we already have some instrumentations which we can take advantage of so so this slide uh, contains uh, sort of focuses on those three which are the major uh, ticket items so they are uh, complex uh, and and expensive this will be the, the gamma ray array, DEGA, implantation array, axis, and neutron detector uh, next. Uh, we work around the, this location where the FDS will be placed. So we used for our design this 5 by 5 meter envelope where we can place, place that, the detector. Uh, so we have to make it sufficiently um, also sufficiently modular and transportable that it can be also utilized uh, at, the, at the low energy beamline. 
And let me just uh, briefly overview what are the ideas for those three components. So the axis will be a, a hybrid implantation array, which will consist of uh, high granularity, large area uh, silicon DSSDs. Uh, uh, and Xint will be a, a somewhat new emerging technology of the inorganic scintillators, which can also be very, very, very gran gran granular. Uh, and provide us with a very high stopping power and a very, very high efficiency for, uh, for, for, for charged particles. So this, this uh, combination gives us kind of the best of two worlds. The, uh, the high resolution offered by silicon can allow us high, 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 high accuracy particle, uh, particle charged particle studies, and the high efficiency will enable us uh, to, to, to obtain really, really high beta detection efficiency. The DEGA array is again a hybrid array which consists of uh, clovers, 16 packed clovers, and we, we did a lot of studies of, uh, of uh, optimizing the geometry, so this will be this rhombicubioctahedron shape which will be where you see where the faces of the clovers will be. Uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, so we simulated the, so we tried to optimize the efficiency, find out what can we really do uh, around, uh, around the clover design. So, so we see uh, the, the gains on the efficiency. The, most, the, the other important contribution to this array is that we have also this high, high resolution, uh, small anode, uh, high purity germanium detectors which will be particularly incredibly, uh, incredibly productive and efficient for, uh, for below 100 kV. And, and you can see that the combined efficiency of this array is now exceeding uh, any known, uh, any, any existing arrays which are used for the decay spectroscopy. So, so the gain is, is, is rather uh, dramatic. The third key, uh, instrument is, is the neutron array. For the neutron-rich isotopes, we have to have high granularity and high, that, uh, high uh, neutron resolution device. And we want to base it on, again, on a new uh, detection system, which is using the segmented scintillator. And the idea is that we want to improve the time of flight resolution by local neutron localization. Uh, so that, uh, that device can, again, be used in, in combination with other detector systems and should give us a factor of less, perhaps even six in, 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 in the detection resolution. So here is the, the summary of the new and old. So we, we have detectors which are identified as, a, as important to make new investments, but there are also other existing detector systems where, where we, we expect to, to use. They may occasionally be need to be upgraded to fit the, 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 the needs of FRIP. And you see here example of co configuration where we combine the high resolution with calorimetric studies and we can use those uh, uh, in, for example, in parallel. We, the kind of key elements of this, this concept is that two focal plane that we can uh, arrange our instruments for uh, simultaneous or, or back-to-back -back experiments uh, without changing the setup. Uh, they, have to be, uh, they have to be placed in a, in a reproducible arrangement, so hybrid detector system on mobile cars, cards, so we, can allow, so we can have a flexibility to quickly reproduce, uh, to, to create reproducible, uh, reproducible arrangements uh, for different experiments, and also uh, digital electronics. We have plenty of exper expertise now in the field to use it, and the triggerless operation allow us to combine uh, data stream from independently from those, from those detector systems so we don't rely on a, on a single trigger, and things can be developed independently by, by involved group. Budget, this is, this is a study which we, we try to create the vision of what is the best we can do now. The budget reflects this, what is it going to cost to do the best. So, so uh, here, is, 
here are the numbers uh, ranging from one to one to ten million. The total cost of the the detector is approximated to be to be about uh, twenty four to thirty million dollars depends depends on uncertainties involved into this pl in this planning process so so all this was summarized in our white paper, which we communicated to, to EFRIP management in January 2019. This, the, the, the white paper is strongly endorsed by, endorsed by EFRIP and queued to DOE for, for budget considerations. Uh, and it's really important that this, uh, this, this, this design, this vision, gives us this tremendous gains in combined, combined efficiencies. Now, EFRIP is coming soon, so we have to be ready for, for this before all this gets funded. So we're trying to realize this vision, which we outlined in a, in a decay station white paper, in this EFRIP decay station demonstrator, because we have several wonderful state-of-the-art instruments which exist in the community. They will give us this baseline efficiencies, baseline access. Uh, but there is a there is number of other functions which, which we expect with other, other benefits from this. First of all, we have to be ready. Second is we will actually put those ideas which we place in a, in a white, place, white paper in, in, in action and see how they work. We, this will hopefully bring a more cohesion to the collaboration and, and provide this, this education and, and interaction platform between different groups. And then we could hopefully enable, we can smoothly transition to the, to, the, to the final FDS when it becomes funded. And so I want to, those of you who are interested in, in, in contributing, uh, come over here or meet next room at 1 p.m. where we discuss uh, how, do we, how do we proceed with that. At, at, and with this last slide, which summarizes all what I said, I want to end my talk. And thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you, Robert. Any questions just now? Okay, I hope that means you're saving them all for the workshop. No, oh, no, sorry, Guy. No, Guy is here. It is. Uh, it has two limitations. One is the limitation for the operation of the device due to the. For example, when we have, uh, we have to deal with neutrons, which will backscatter. Uh, second limitation is to, that we, it constrains our design. So we have to work, work around the size of the room. So that design works with this constraint. So if we want to have, if we want to think bigger, or if there is a new ideas which will, ex you know, go try to reach beyond those limitations, that will have to be factored in. And the third is practicalities, that we will have to cram uh, equipment, electronics in a small space, uh, and that simply affects the convenience, flexibility of, of, of uh, doing the experiment. So, so there, is, there is a number of uh, drawbacks due to the size of this room, and we thought about that Already, yeah. Okay, just off last question. Okay. okay, if there's no more pressing questions, there will be more chance to talk about the decay station this afternoon. So we will thank Robert again. Thank you very much. Now I will self-chair. Okay, so 
We are now officially at the end of the low energy part of the meeting, though I will remind you that there are workshops this afternoon. But as is um, tradition now, we, we have to look at the resolutions that we want to put forth as a community this year. Um, but before that, um, I just have a few comments. First, um, I'd like to recognize that I'm standing up here representing the community uh, meeting organizing committee and those folks' names are up here. Um, and just, oh, thanks. A little bit of statistics. So more than 170 people actually registered in advance. And as you can see by the very few name tags that were left outside on the table, um, all of those folks turned up. And there's a number of handwritten name tags for those who didn't manage to register. So uh, again, excellent turnout. Um, we've had 11 working group sessions in addition to the Theory Alliance meeting, which was a three-hour session. Um, and of course, the plenary talks that we've all heard, both giving us updates on the status of the user facilities, the Aruna facilities, um, and also the EFRA project, which is at 92, probably 93% by now, um, racing forward. Um, and I think in a couple years' time, this meeting will be very different as we talk about the actual measurements ongoing at EFRIB. We also had a number of talks highlighting the work of the Theory Alliance, the work of GINA, um, and the efforts in the national security and nuclear data enterprises. And Philomena, thank you for your talk yesterday um, and the importance of diversity in and inclusion and education, which is always an important reminder uh, every time we get together here like this. I will mention a few times yet, but EFRIB um, Decay Station and Greta workshops are still upcoming, so don't be planning to rush off right after uh, lunch. There's still more to discuss this afternoon. But I think that, this I said last year, but I think the uh, low energy meeting here continues to really be the place where we come together and really have a fruitful exchange of ideas, updates of information, um, and really help to roadmap our future in between the kind of more extreme long-range planning exercises. So this is just a reminder of the working groups. This was more to remind me to um, threaten, for lack of a better word, the uh, organizers of the working groups to get me slides. We will be posting those online. So if you didn't manage to make it to the working group, maybe you had a double booking and you want to see what was actually discussed, there will be summary slides posted online. If you are a convener, I have your names. I will follow up. Um, and you can ask a number of people how relentless I can be. So um, that is a threat. OK, so the main order of business, um, and I think we can set a speed record this year. This is what my aim is for the resolutions. So the way I'd like to do this is I will read through each of these. Um, and then we can discuss them if there's any comments or questions or changes that want to be made. Um, and then we'll basically have a vote uh, on each resolution. So six in total, um, sorry, five in total that we like to put forward this year. The first, EFRIB remains our top priority. The community eagerly anticipates the completion of EFRIB and building of the instrumentation necessary to realize EFRIB's tremendous scientific potential. Progress on the key instruments Greta and SACAR is proceeding well. A timely start of the HRS is the community's priority. Following the 2015 long-range plan, the FDS, the decay station, and Solaris are necessary for our community to realize EFRIB's scientific opportunities. Second, operation of the national user facilities, ATLAS and NSCL, at optimal levels is fundamental to the health of our community. The Aruna facilities are central to the low energy science program and their continued effective operation is crucial. The community strongly supports the funding of these facilities and associated research groups at both universities and national laboratories. The third, uh, GINA has become an essential part of low energy nuclear science, providing critical interdisciplinary connections and educational opportunities. We strongly endorse continued support for GINA. The fourth is for the EFRIB Theory Alliance. The EFRIB Theory Alliance is an essential component of our field. The bridge faculty and theory fellowship positions at universities and national laboratories help to grow capability in this important aspect of our community. 
We strongly endorse continued support of the Ephraim Theory Alliance and its programs, including computational theory and related astrophysics. And then finally, the science case for an energy upgrade of Ephraim to 400 MeV per nucleon is extremely compelling and would significantly expand the science opportunities as Ephraim, at Ephraim as outlined in the Ephraim 400 white paper. So now we'll go through them individually. Is there any comments or discussion anyone would like to raise on the first bullet endorsing Ephraim and the associated instrumentation? Okay, all in favor of this resolution? Okay, anyone opposed? Perfect. <laughs> the, the order is, is how they will be presented, so yes, you can say that. Okay, the second bullet, is there any uh, discussion or comments related to the endorsement of the user facilities and Aruna facilities? David? So the community strongly supports. So you would suggest the community endorses continued support. Sorry, I can't, can't hear you. OK. OK, so the communities can endorses continued support. OK, well, OK, sorry. I thought that that might have been what you were saying, but then we have support and support, and it just sounded weird to me. <laughs> OK. Does anyone else have something to add to what David's suggesting? OK. OK, we have a vote for the word funding. <laughs> uh, the second. All right, I'm, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just going to ask Kyle to do me a big favor and run the microphone, because it's impossible to hear some of these. <laughs> So the community strongly support to the continued funding. Is everybody happy with that? So the community strongly supports the continued funding of these facilities and associated research groups at both universities and national laboratories. Any more comments? OK. All in favor? Any opposition? OK. Uh, the third bullet is, as we heard from Hendrik, um, Gina is looking for the support of the community um, as they move forward in the next cycle. So um, that's where this came from. I think we can all agree at how fruitful Gina has been. Um, so any comments or, or questions on this one? Yeah, Jorge. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> Well, I certainly have no objection to the resolution. I think Gina has been doing fantastic. The only thing that I need some clarification is the ranking. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with the ranking of Gina third, for example, relative to the alliance? So there wasn't a lot of discussion in terms of the, the ranking. Um, we did swap these two in earlier discussions um, because I hadn't thought at all when I first wrote them out. Um, so we can certainly, I'm assuming what you're suggesting is we move the theory alliance Okay. Yeah. So it, there is, there honestly wasn't a strong rationale for the for the ordering. Um, so if, if people have concerns about the ordering, we can certainly. <laughs> Hendrik. Yeah. 
Does anyone have a specific concern about the ordering of Gina as the third? Okay. Okay, so let's, assuming that this is the third um, resolution, all those in favor? Any opposition? Okay, thank you. The fourth for the Theory Alliance. Any discussion? So I assume this was actually discussed as part of the Theory Alliance workshop yesterday. Um, so this has already been endorsed by the Theory Alliance itself. But any comments or? Okay, well, let's vote again. All good. <laughs> any opposition? Nope. Perfect. And then finally, the case for the ultimate the effort upgrade of EFRA 400. Um, any comments? I'm assuming a lot of you have seen the white paper that was sent around recently and understand the compelling case here. So, sorry. So the, so the one last year says we strongly support the upgrade, and this one just states this that there is, just is an a upgrade. Statement, yeah. yeah. Uh, we can change the wording certainly, but the EFRIB folks were comfortable with this. So, okay. Any comments? Otherwise, in favor? No opposition? Any opposition? Okay. So I think um, that basically brings us to a close. We've unanimously accepted these resolutions, um, and these will be forwarded on. They'll also be posted, so you can go back and, and remind yourself what we all agreed on. And before we head to lunch, yeah, I made up time. We're early again. Um, just a few last notes. As I said, we're not done. There are workshops this afternoon. So the EFRIB Decay Station workshop is in fact in this room. Um, the Greta workshop is in Pen 2, which is just behind the wall there. So if you're planning on attending one of those, both of those will start at 1 p.m. Uh, after the lunch break. If you are not planning on joining in on one of those workshops or you're going to join a little later perhaps after the tour, um, if you want to go and see the lab, Calvin Howell will be leading that tour, and the idea is to actually congregate, yeah, Calvin, um, to actually congregate just outside um, here where the, basically where the coffee breaks are and just past there. Yeah. Uh, Calvin? So as far as what I heard there, you'll be walk over, you'll get there about 1.30, and then it's about an hour and a half um, to tour the facilities. So that puts you back around 3 o'clock or so. Um, and just because this was mentioned a couple of times and it may have gotten lost in your inboxes with the barrage of emails this coming this week, um, the letter for operations, uh, re-operations support during the EFRIB transition period uh, is available online. If you didn't see it in your inbox, you can sign it at the EFRIB user's website. So just in case anybody missed that. So with that, I would like to thank you all for coming, thank the organizing committee, and in particular, I think Art and Robert have done a fantastic job uh, this year being our hosts, so let's thank them. and safe travels home. And I think we do have a box lunch. So thank you all.